got on such a good roll there for a bit. I know. And then I fucked it up by saying, oh, God, we got to do undercooked analysis. <laughs> no, you're fine. Welcome to... We actually have to do undercooked analysis now? Are you kidding me? Ugh. Fuck. I got to read. I don't want all reading. Who reads anymore? Come on, who reads anymore? Well, luckily, the stories... Uh, I think uh, w- either one or two stories that we'll be reading are by Cleric of Madness. So what? Like, Cleric of Madness? Which he, he usually writes some good stuff. Or at least stuff that makes me laugh, like David. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping for a very glaring typo that will completely change how we think about the main <laughs> yes! character again. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Cleric. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to glaring typo analysis. <laughs> Just... It, him reading my grandchild instead of my godchild. <laughs> this is uh, why you need to write it. This is why you don't need to write it on your phone. I don't know. Autocorrect he, is an asshole. Did he uh, write it on canon. his phone? New no. canon. <laughs> I'm just being a dick. Oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> speaking, speaking of which, it's it's me. I'm hi. I'm David. Uh, cleric, I guess wrote a story about me one time, but it wasn't actually about me. But we can pretend it is because David is an asshole. Anyway. Uh, and, 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 and there's Kayla. Hi. And there's Abysme. Hello. And we got three Cleric of Madness stories for you. So you know what this means? Are it's we, short shivery time. Are Woo. we reading all three? Or yeah, let's read all three. Are, They're very them. short. Oh, okay. Well, one I of think... them is six pages. Oh, two. Let's read. Probably two. Let's read two. And then if we feel like it, we'll do three. Or we'll save the third one for another go around. Yeah. This is what happens. We come into this with kind of a plan. I mean, anybody who's listened to this show for the past decade knows that we rarely come into this with any real solid plan. So that's just the way it is. That's just the way it's going to stay. Because, my goodness, the turnaround on this is pretty high. Uh, or, or we could read one story. And uh, Cleric actually provided descriptions that I thought were kind of funny. Um, for Well, some uh, for each one, let me see. So Suburban Terrors, he described as it's a piece about how sometimes the monsters lurking in our communities are monsters, but most of the times they're not. Okay. Then there's a Cherry Red Liberation, which he says, there's also the garage sale VHS murder tape store. <laughs> Ooh. And then, that's some creepypasta shit Ooh, right there. And then good. uh, uh for passageways, he describes as a Lovecraftian story that simply exists as its own brief moment, just like human lives. Mm. Oh man, a haunted VHS or just VHS murder tape is does kind of say the need right now. So yeah, you know, okay. So I thought we do that, and then next time we can do suburban terrors and passageways together because I do All like right. my Lovecraft stuff. But yeah, this just sounds fun. Well, we'll save them for the for the next time, which will probably be after we do yet another uh, set of Doctor Satan stories. Yeah. Or by set, I mean we'll read one Doctor Satan story over two episodes, like we do, and then we'll come back to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cherry red, L- Cherry red liberation sounds like Colon. a sounds like a brand name for a car. It's, uh, it's my favorite why. Mountain Dew flavor. <laughs> okay, so these are short paragraphs. How do we want to? Um. Uh, just, do we want to go like really dedicated popcorn style, where literally every paragraph we switched yeah. off, or is that too exhausting? It's probably too exhausting. Let's just take a chunk and then. Ah, uh, okay, that's good. Uh, and we'll just pass when we feel like it. How about that? Who goes yeah. first? Why don't you go first, Kayla? Okay. And then uh, after that, uh, you you get to choose who to pass it to. All right. Megan awoke with a jolt as someone knocked on her front door. Clearly, she glanced at the clock. Five forty-five a.m. It read. Groaning hassle. Whoever fucking knocked at my door or calls me at 5.45 a.m., I'm going to be so pissed. There better be a gas line about to explode or yes. something. <laughs> there better be a fucking accident or something bad has happened or... There's a tsunami coming. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Groaning, she rolled off the couch where she had landed the night before after work and looked through the peephole. It was her friend James bobbing and weaving his head around in an apparent attempt to catch a glimpse of Megan from the windows. Sighing, she opened the door. James briskly stepped in and walked to the kitchen and turned on the coffee maker. Oh, yes, and do make yourself at home, said Megan dryly. What brings you here at this ungodly hour? The sun isn't even up yet, so why am I? 
I hate James already. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if we're like the best of friends. You don't just walk into my fucking house and not at 545 in the morning. And don't take my goddamn coffee, right? Oh, no. You do not touch my <laughs> coffee maker. If, if I'm sorry, Abyssie, but if you docked at my door at 5.45 a.m. and just came in and started making coffee, I'd be like, the what fuck the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it's nice to see you, but at the same time, why? <laughs> no, no. That is such an invasion of privacy. Yeah. <clears throat> do you want to choose to throw it to? Uh, Abyssie. Garage sales, replied Drames. James, James, Jesus Christ, I can't read either. Replied James, throwing his hands up and waving them with all the flair of a showman. You always said you wanted to go to some. Megan raised an eyebrow. And I also said I was never awake early enough for them. She shot back, crossing her arms. You're awake now, aren't you? He retorted as he poured himself a cup of coffee. Megan, he already made the coffee? Okay. Megan's expression softened with the realization. Yes, but she stammered. And there's one right here in your own neighborhood, so we won't even have to go that far, he continued. Come on, get dressed, he said, pointing to her wrinkled work uniform, and I'll be waiting for you in the car. James continued to ignore her as he walked out of her. Walks in, takes coffee, walks out. No. (laughs) How do you make the coffee that quickly? Walk his ass out. (laughs) This is some next level best friend shit, apparently. Jesus Christ. Wow. Uh, walked out of her house. Resignedly, she slunk off to her bedroom and changed. She also spritzed some perfume on for good measure. David. Okay. All right, she said as she came out, nursing her own cup of coffee in the vain hopes that it would assist her in coping with being up at such an early hour. The sky was beginning to turn a light pink, but the sun had still yet to crest the horizon. Let's get this train wreck of my day on the road, shall we? Uh, another day. <laughs> another day, another garage sale. Another train wreck. <laughs> that's my secret every day's a train wreck <laughs> <laughs> that's the spirit james joked as he drove down the uh, drove toward the sale it was at the far end of her neighborhood a winding road dotted with houses it was a kind of wide set affair where no one's backyards need worry about touching yet where every everyone knew the business of everyone else almost before it was complete it wasn't something megan would have been able to afford were it not for her parents assistance The house in question was similar to many of the others, a two-story house with a dark green shingled roof and a two-car garage. The yard was littered with folding tables covered in boxes of various sizes and hastily scrawled labels. Okay, is it me? Who the fuck sets up garage sales at 6 a.m.? Yeah, no. Um, Fairly early, but not at 6. No, I don't think I've ever... I mean, granted, I don't really go to garage sales. But I don't even see signs out until, like, people will put out signs at, like, 8 or 9. I mean, when Dave and I had our own garage sale when we were moving, I think it, we started at, like, 9 a.m. I think we did, yeah. We were, we were, it's not like you're going to put up signs and say garage sale tomorrow and people yeah. are going to plan for it. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, all right, Kayla. Uh, Jane. Uh, James leaned in toward Megan as they made the walk up to the yard from the street. I read this lady's husband died and she's looking to clear out old memories. Watson, I think, was her last name. Shady characters, a lot of them, from what I understand. You don't even live here and you know as much as any of the other gossip hounds that live here do. You ought to really stop listening to what other people, what people around here say. They're out for the worst for everyone. Bunch of sanctimonious blowhards. <laughs> If yes, I used to play bass for sanctimonious <laughs> blowhards. If you ask me, she said with a tone and a look that James recognized. I'm really not surprised that James knows all this. He probably walked into everyone else's house and just asked them about their day. <laughs> Good morning. What? James is like Gracie. He doesn't believe in doors. <laughs> I suppose he wisely said, dropping the subject. He knew better. Hello, said an older lady who was seated behind the metal cash box. Please take your time and thank you for stopping by. Can I get you some tea? Oh, that sounds nice. Uh, Thank you, but no, said Megan as she turned her coffee cup around her hands. You, sir? Mrs. Watson asked, turning to James, who had forgotten his coffee in the car. James glanced back to the road. If you wouldn't mind, yes, please, he answered sheepishly. He needed more caffeine, any kind, really, to keep up the lie that was him being awake. One moment, then, Mrs. Watson said with a grin as she made her way inside. Do keep looking, though. There honestly wasn't much to interest James or Megan, aside from a few old books with two worn spines for transport, let alone reading. 
They had made it halfway through fruitlessly peering into musty boxes of even mustier junk when Mrs. Watson returned with a tall glass of iced tea. Here you are, sugar, she said, handing him the drink. Nodding with a slight bow, he eagerly accepted it and began to sip at it heartily. It was cloyingly sweet, just how he liked it. Hey, look at this, he said, pointing at a small box on a table from across across from them. David. Practically illegibly written across the side with the, was with the letters VHS. It was more of a marvel, either how poor the penmanship was or how quickly it was written, rather than the prospect of its contents. Interesting, said Megan, as she poked her head over the box's rim. There were about two dozen VHS tapes with home consumer handwritten labels. How much for the VHSs, ma'am? Oh, those old things, they're just old movies we recorded over the years. How's about $3 for the whole box? <laughs> uh, number one, sucker. Number two, well, no, they're both suckers, because we recorded. Mm. Mm. We recorded. Ooh. These are all of our sex tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed in with footage from a birthday party. One of them should show, tell you how Mr. Watson died. <laughs> Autoerotic <laughs> asphyxiation. It was the best night of our lives. <laughs> I used to, my husband used to dress up as a monkey and I would walk around. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, yes, the monkey boy of the neighborhood. Little, this is just like brutal moose just going around and finding tapes and shit. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Sounds good to me, she said excitedly and dug around her purse for the the three least crumbled dollar bills she had. She handed them off the box and the box was hers. She loved watching, watching movies people have recorded on tape ancient commercials and all. To her, it was a voyeuristic look into people's lives as they were at the time of the recording. It was the right amount of distant yet intimate she could find in such a simple act as watching something another person found so remarkable or memorable that they wished to etch it into permanence. Seeing nothing further of interest after a few more minutes of perusal, the two made their way back to the car and left, returning the tea glass and thanking Mrs. Watson. Shall we go try some other sales? James asked, the two quickly making their way out of your shot of Mrs. Watson waved. And uh, Kayla, I'm going to pass it back to you. Not long after they had driven away, a younger man came out carrying a box for the sale. Mother, he said, addressing (laughs) (laughs) Have you seen a box full of old VHS tapes? I, he said, searching for the most accurate arrangement of words was trying to find an old tape that I really wanted to make sure wasn't lost or sold. (laughs) Sex tape. Oh, I'm so sorry, Henry, Mrs. Watson said with a frown. I'm afraid I just sold that to the lady that lives at the other end of the street. I think I heard them talking about going to other garage sales. Maybe you could catch up to him, she added helpfully. Henry's expression turned to a a sort of frowning sneer. Yes, mother, he said almost (laughs) through gritted teeth. That's exactly what I will be doing. This is some fucking, like, psycho-level stuff right here. Yeah. Oh, I should probably say, Yes, Mother, that's exactly what I'll be doing. Well, good, dear. I hope you can get your little tape back, said Mrs. Watson with a warm smile. Now, please, be a dear and keep bringing in the rest of the boxes out. If nothing else, you can go to her house later and see if she will be so kind as to return it. She seems like a nice enough girl. Yes, Mother, he said quickly. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Walking back inside, he began to fester on how he let that box slip out of his grasp. It was the one thing you had to remember, Henry. One thing! (laughs) And after a few other interesting garage sales and other nearby subdivisions, James returned Megan home. Thanks, James, she said half-jokingly. My life's dream has been fulfilled. I can die a happy woman, or at least finally shower like one. Same time tomorrow, James asked with a laugh. It's your funeral if you do, she answered with a bit too much seriousness for James. Seriously, though, see you around, he said, and made his way back home. Yeah, fuck you, James. Lugging the, bo- <laughs> the box back into her living room, she plopped it on the couch and began to rifle through its contents. I, I just clicked. So, Cherry Red Liberation. That does kind of sound like the name of a porno. It Either that or a snuff film. Yeah. It's probably a snuff film, but we'll see. It, but it does have that sort of... Yeah. Ugh. Cherry Red. Liberate her titties. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what we have here. She said aloud to herself. Looks like a few old movies. She continued reading off of a few names. Casablanca, Little Women, Double Indemnity. Looks like they're fans of pre-color cinema. 
when you just say black and white now or old movies, whatever. Oh, <laughs> here's a few television episodes. Dragnet and I Love Lucy. How interesting. It was bum, then she bum, came bum, across. Bum. <laughs> Sorry. It was then she came across one tape that was facing down unlike the others. She extracted it and turned it over. Written on it in the dark red ink was the most curious title she had ever seen. Cherry Red Liberation. Ooh. How very odd, she exclaimed. She examined the tape. It was nothing special inside from the odd labeling. Megan eyed her VCR with curious intent. The tape, as she plainly saw, had been thoughtfully and kindly rewound. Someone, she thought to herself, paid attention to Blockbuster's pleas back in the day. (laughs) Easing herself to her knees, she gently slid the tape into the VCR. She was eager to see what kind of video this cherry red liberation was. Oh, boy. From the outset, it was clear that the tape was made on an old camcorder. If the tam- timestamp ever present in the lower left was to be believed, the date, 2005, indicated how recent the recording had been made. Ooh, interesting. Oh, hmm. so this must have been. Oh, five? Oh, five. Interesting. So this probably takes place not long from there. Like, Holy oh. shit, 19 years ago. Fuck. Oh, my God. Why was she right? Uh. The setting was familiar. It was the backyard of Mrs. Watson's house. Megan recognized the tool shed and cellar door. In the beginning, was nothing remarkable. Just the camera operator approaching the cellar door and walking down some of the noiseless stairs, Megan, some of the, the noisiest stairs Megan had ever heard. It wasn't until the person holding the camera reached the bottom of the stairs that Megan got a good glimpse of him in a nearby mirror. She paused the video and rewound it to make sure it was him. It was Mrs. Watson's son, Henry. Interesting, she thought. Must have been a school project for college, she reasoned. Did, does she know who Henry is? I'm, I mean, I assume everybody in this neighborhood seems to know everybody else. Yeah, so. yeah, okay. No, that's fair. So, yeah, because I mean, there is that whole discussion of like, oh, how um, her friend James knows seems to know everything about the neighborhood more than true. She does, but it seems like she knows. And it's a small like community, so maybe yeah. everyone just knows. All right, your turn. Then Henry panned the camera over to reveal a woman who was seated in the fetal position on an old mattress. She had her arms and legs tied in a few places by some kind of white fabric. Oh, God, it is a... It's a stuff film. 59 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Her, Her mouth was bound by a similar fabric that was placed between her lips as some sort of makeshift gag. Her pale, chalky white skin glistened with sweat. She was wearing nothing except for her for her almost skin tone equivalent light lacy white underwear. It looked fairly lacy, as though this was not the place to which she had intended to wear it. Uh, I always mm. wear my lace in the basement. <laughs> basement lace. Megan paused the video. She leaned in closer to the, her television, poring over the image before her. This must have been a very good actress. That's your oh, first come on. thought. <laughs> no, come it's on. not. How naive. <laughs> Noting how it seemed like she had been wearing and crying on the same makeup for quite some time. Her eyes were a stained mess from running eyeliner that had bled well past her chin. The only makeup on her that seemed otherwise flawless was a thick coat of cherry red lipstick that shone in the light, no doubt covered by an ev- even heavier layer of lip gloss. Okay. So do do we do we buy? I mean, I'm assuming this is like modern day because we mentioned 2005. So even if it was like 2006, do we really buy that Megan would? Her first thought would be. Oh, this is clearly a school project and not, oh my God, this is a fucking snuff film. Because ah! you can you can normally tell. Normally. Normally. I, I, think, I think by Was this Was there a point, title card? Yeah, I think by this point, I, I would basically just assume that it's like, oh, this is just his he, his, he filmed a sex video. That's what I would think. It just like, oh, this is not for me. I'm going to, I probably should bring this back. Um. And, like this was probably not supposed to be sold to me. Um, I don't think my first thought would be snuff necessarily, because I mean, tied up in a basement though. But like, I don't know. It's like that whole like, oh, this might be kinky. Sh- the kinky yeah, sh- sure. But like, even then. Oh, but she's crying know. though. Yeah. I mean, like, what the fuck? 
Yeah, I, I, I would. My curiosity would get the better of me, and I'd probably like watch more just to make sure. And then if it did just turn out to be like some kinky thing, and like a safer word was said or something, I'd be like, oh, okay, well, whoopsie. But yeah, yeah no, I think I'd be like, this this looks bad, <laughs> and I, I need I to think, like confirm. But I think okay, good, good point. I think by this point, you wouldn't think, oh, this is a good actress. You would think, the, oh the, my god, what the yeah. fuck? What the fuck am I looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, but also how naive is is uh, Megan here in this? Does case? she need like, to be naive for the story to explain the events of the tape? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Like I just She'd said, be, like, I'd be curious to like confirm. Watching. Yeah, exactly. Like who wouldn't be able to? It's a train wreck. Who's not going to? And she said her day was going to be another train wreck. And here you go. You can't look away from train wrecks. So, yeah. Yeah. Weird. Like I knew one girl who was doing a weird sexy video. Mm-hmm. For her um, uh, college project, like, uh, and this was someone who was like a housemate. Uh, we were in the same dorm, and then this guy is like standing there sp- smoking a cigarette. And we're, um, I remember him seeing him like a uh, high, and then she comes down in a uh, bathrobe. It's like, oh, are you ready? Let's go back up. Did like, um, but like, was that like first person footage, or was it like clearly filmed? No, like- no, no, no. This, this was um. This was what she's like. She said that, oh, I'm filming. Like, I'm filming oh, this. Okay. I didn't I didn't see the film, but she oh, said she, okay. she was making a film. And in that and a lot of people are like, basically. I my first I was surprised to see her in the bathroom. And then later on, I had uh, some of my housemates say, oh, no, she's doing nudity in her. OK, OK. Ah. But- but like if 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 I'm thinking college film, you know, there's probably a title card. Um, it's well, it might be filmed like first person found footage style. But there's like there's typically tells. There's not just well, someone picks up a a, a camera uh, and then turns it on and then walks into their fucking basement with a tied up oh, woman. Okay, uh, another thing too. I remember because uh, I also had to film. I remember that I also had to film uh, do small films for college as mm-hmm. well. But I was terrible at it. When I did films, I didn't always put a title card or anything like that because it's like I didn't know how to fuck how the fuck to do that. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, I think the funniest or wildest video that I saw was this per was this guy just walking up and down Venice Beach, uh, interviewing uh, a girl who was uh, trying to buy a weed, and then he's it ends with him and his friend filming him, and he's like are you really going to smoke weed on camera? He's like, I'm graduating this year. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he played this for our class. Yeah. That's awesome. To say it was a, uh, no, it's Hollywood magic. It's not real weed. <laughs> you don't know that I'm smoking weed on, Ven- on in Venice beach. <laughs> you're, you'd think I would. So, but I don't think by this point, no, I would, uh, I would not think it's a school project. Especially if you're not like if you were okay, you know what? If you were a film person, then maybe you might think of this as a school project. Because you're like you're like, I've seen people do weird shit for films, college films. But I don't think many people would think that if they they're not film students, though. Mm-hmm. I think they would think this is this is a snuff. Film. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, or you know, okay, I'll I'll be generous. Maybe Megan's like, oh, this person's making something that looks like a snuff film, you know? Like, yeah, we don't have a lot of characterization project. for Megan, so I guess we can give her the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I mean, we know what it's actually going to be, but yeah, sure, I'll give it to that. Um, do, okay. do, do you want to? Yeah, continue, I'll, or do you want to convince this was a, still a school project? She made time to prepare some her some her her. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh. Oh no! Oh, her, her. Famous caramel drizzle popcorn before continuing watching. Calming a fistful of kernels, she resumed the video. Uh, do we want to take bets if that popcorn gets thrown up by the end of this? Oh, probably uh, will. Probably will. Henry cleared his throat, and the woman sat up weakly. She looked at him with eyes that seemed to burn as red as her lips. She began to sob softly. Now, now, Cherry Red, don't give me the waterworks just yet. I'm going to set you free today, said Henry. Today is your liberation. So she's going to die. Cherry Red stopped crying and looked down at the floor. She started to rub her lips against the gag, which only succeeded in smearing her lipstick. Henry yelled and placed the camera on a nearby table. Megan watched as she rushed toward a cabinet. He rushed toward a cabinet on the wall, opened it, and retrieved a few tubes. He then hurried over to Cherry Red and slapped her hard. 
The slap seemed to echo throughout the basement as well as Megan's house. He f- she flinched and reflexively cl- clutched her own cheek. Henry then grabbed Cherry Red by the chin and undid her gag. Are we going to be a good girl today? He asked through clenched teeth. Oh, sorry. Are we going to be a good girl today? He asked. <laughs> I love that Like this is a, 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 a motif with Henry. He loves to grit his teeth and talk to it. Yes, mother. Mother. <laughs> Though Megan had to rewind it with a heightened volume to hear what, was, what he was muttering at that distance. Cherry Red didn't reply, only uttering whimpers as her face was squeezed together. Henry bit off the top of the tube of one of the tubes and began smearing what looked like what looked to be lipstick across Cherry Red's, Red's lips. I can't read fucking either today. She All struggled, right. but he was able to do a fairly decent job. Wiping off excess and extraneous lipstick, he released her face with a push. David. Okay. You need to behave, Cherry Red. I won't be able to save you today, he said gruffly. Cherry Red froze, looking up with hope in her eyes. Freedom? She whimpered in a voice so soft, Megan was scarcely sure she heard it. Freedom, said Henry as he picked up a large knife. I'm going to cut those bonds that tie you to here. He said as he grabbed her arm and examined her bindings. Henry uh, pulled back the knife and plunged it directly into Cherry Red's stomach. Mm -hmm. Megan and Cherry Red screamed, one in sheer surprise, the other in sheer pain. Megan leapt up. Blood gushed out of Cherry Red's pale skin, staining her lacy white panties a dark cherry red. The popcorn and the blood cool on the floor as they both spilled out. Yep. Like, <laughs> respectively, and, and the blood. Oh, like, like at Megan's. the same time. Yeah, yeah, the same time. Megan fumbled with the remote, dropping it on the floor. She glanced up at the television, only to see Henry repeatedly stabbing Cherry Red in the chest and stomach. She fell to the ground and watched in horror as Cherry Red's body went limp. You have been liberated, my love, freed from the bondage of life. I have also been freed, freed from the love you never felt for me. We are all liberated now. Henry proclaimed, waving his hands in the air and something resembling a preacher gesticulating. She could take no more. She finally steeled her nerves and slammed her thumb down on the VCR remote stop button. Then she began to panic. Oh, God, she muttered to herself as she scrambled to take the tape out of the machine. He's going to want this tape back. And I'm sure his mother told him who bought it. Oh, oh. Go to the police right now. Hop in a car. Yeah. Hands shaking, she put the tape back into the box as she originally found it face down. She then took steps to clean herself in case he came knocking. That way she wouldn't look like she had just seen a probable murder. No, no, no. She told herself as she slapped her face repeatedly. This is just some really good acting. She continued to rationalize. (laughs) That I can believe that like she's trying to convince herself. Yeah. Just then she heard footsteps outside her front door. Then came a knock. Oh. Yep. You know what? Actually, I kind of like it's not just like oh, it's cursed, and then we're, it's the fear of like, oh, someone that I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a good uh, way to spin this. Uh, it's very, um, it feels very kind of clove hitch killer a little bit because you, it's about, there's nothing supernatural about it and you, you know, you know, and it's someone that the character knows. And it's, there's a lot of good tension. Yeah. I think what should have, happened though like i think she should have seen oh it must be one of his silly tapes pause it make the popcorn then come back and then play it and then as it plays and shows the, the stuff she can't look away yeah yeah there's probably more that could be done there you're right mm. but i mean that would be a qu- easy quick fix i just it's hard for me to believe that she, her first thought is like no this is clearly a a lot uh, of this story so far is very i think rushed for instance mm-hmm. and it's kind of it's a minor nitpick until it compounds upon itself. In the beginning, James walks in, goes to the coffee maker. We have like two lines of dialogue exchanged and the coffee's already ready. You know, we didn't even get a line about, you know, they sat there talking for a couple of minutes or maybe there was more dialogue to make it feel like time passed because coffee does not just, you know, it's not you just turn it on unless it's like a, you know, like a K cup or something. But even then, you know, it takes a little bit. So yeah, you could, uh, and it's not, I know it's six pages. It's not that long. It actually reads pretty quickly. So yeah. maybe slow down the pace a little bit. Yeah. But I, for the mo- most part, I like the, I do like the dialogue. It does. There, yeah. It does show some character uh, for each per- for the, each person. Um, but I, I think you're right. The pace can be slowed, but I do like this twist of, oh, shit. This per- I know this person, mm-hmm. and this person is coming to see- 
to probably get this tape back. Oh shit. Yeah. Um, just then she heard footsteps outside her front door. Then came a knock. Every hair on Megan's body stood up as she tensed out of fear. Her body was hot and flushed with terror. Knees, weak arms. <laughs> God damn it. I'm going to find a way to bring this. Someone, in. someone has to pick it up. But she forced herself to the door. Glancing at the peephole, she saw him. It was Henry tapping his foot impatiently. Take it away, Abby. One second, Megan said as she unbolted the door and opened it. Hello, Henry. How are you? I'm fine, he said curtly. May I come in? Well, at least he asks. He's a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> of course, said Megan, gesturing for him to enter. She was a picture of calmness, though in truth she was ready to start vibrating like a newborn fawn. What brings you here at, she said, pausing to glance at the clock, this late in the afternoon. <laughs> well, he said, clearing his throat to deliver a speech he had been rehearsing. Earlier today, you bought some old tapes that my mother accidentally sold to you. I was hoping to get them back. I will, of course, be giving you your money back. I do apologize for the mistake. Megan smiled. Oh, of course. I understand completely, she said, grabbing the box and shoving it toward him. Outward toward him. Could just be toward him. I haven't even gone through them yet, she added, hoping to, in some way, keep him from thinking she had even laid eyes on Cherry Red Liberation. She didn't rewind it, did she? <gasps> No. no, it was rewound. It was, they made a big point about it. it was rewound. She had to rewind the tape. He's going to know. <laughs> oh. oh, no. Thank you, he said as he took the box in one arm and, and retrieved the money she was owed with the other. Good night, miss, he said as he left. David. Megan closed the door behind her, and she could hear his loud footsteps on the wooden porch as he walked. She could also hear the sounds of him on rummaging through the old through old tapes. Megan quickly began to look at her f- for her phone. She knew he had to, she had to call the police, but she was sure it was in the entry hall. He couldn't have taken it when I wasn't looking, could he? She whispered to herself. He couldn't know that I watched it, but if he wanted insurance, maybe. I'm sure he, it's around here. So- Megan froze in terror with a sudden realization. Then both noises from outside stopped. She heard Henry sigh. Megan could do nothing but look blankly at the television. Static danced around like the snowflakes from some of Megan's happiest childhood memories of winter. Megan chuckled. It was all too so absurd. She could hear Henry cocking his gun. I forgot to rewind, she said resignedly. Oh, no. Nice. That's it. That's the end. Nice. Yeah, no, punchy. I like it. Yeah, me too. That was awesome. Very good. <laughs> And I do, we said it once, but I do like that it wasn't uh, like haunted or supernatural or something. Not that that's a bad thing, no. <clears throat> but um, the more kind of, we don't have a lot of just the more kind of grounded um, down to earth that, uh, you know, kind of approach uh, as much anymore. And I, I appreciate it because it's refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think for this type of story, that whole opening was kind of unnecessary of like her talking with her friend and then going uh yeah garage sailing. she could have just gone garage sailing all things considered i'm yeah. garage sailing and away the, and I, maybe maybe it's just me maybe i'm I, I mean i don't often go to garage sales so i don't i or maybe this is a small town thing that small town people are like we start our garage sales at 7 a.m <laughs> i don't know but it uh, I, I feel like if you're gonna take the time to do that setup you need to spend it building up Megan's character or involving James as an important character to come back later on, or something has to be accomplished. All that was really accomplished is Megan doesn't like being woken up at 545. Who does? Um, This is a small town or this is a small community. Everyone knows each other, but yeah, like, if if we're Occam's razoring this, yeah, it, it kind of feels like either that could have been taken out or just shortened or maybe something else, you know, either build it up, shorten it down or get rid of it. But it, as it is, is kind of like, eh. I, I think she could have just been already at the, started with her at the garage sale. And then her, uh, her conversation with uh, Mrs. Watson could easily show, oh, yeah, this is just a, a town where everybody knows each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's already a really small cast. Like James, if you take James out of this, nothing is lost. But all th- I mean, all things considered, good setup. I, I, the the snuff film is like a typical snuff film. Sure. But it's the oh shit, mm-hmm. he's coming back for it. That's like the 
oh fuck yeah no that was great and yeah it didn't drag on or anything it was very just uh and it feels like a like a you know a horror mini series this is a really good just good single entry you know oh it's absolutely just, it's really really yeah. really well done i like the imagery mm-hmm. yeah this was again i think you said it best when you said short punchy and we gave the real we had the realization before uh megan did and that was really cool mm-hmm. yeah which and it's that's not a realization that's so early on that it's going to like spoil anything. No, it was, it was logical and not, maybe not everyone's going to pick it up, but those who do, you know, it's not like you had to have to spend the rest of the story going like, yeah, let's get to the end. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it was actually a pretty breezy read too. That was the other yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. She got through it a little faster than I anticipated. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think we have enough time to uh, What's do this? these? What's the shortest one? Suburban uh, Terrors is three. It says three pages. It's more like two, two, two and like a quarter page. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that. Okay. okay. Uh, we, got, we, we got a suburban theme with these stories. We sure do. It's Sub- a suburban terror. S- suburban short and sh- shivery, I suburban, guess. <laughs> suburban. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, I, I read. I finished the last one. So let's keep the, the same order. I finished that last bit. So okay. Kayla, you can take it to start with. In every city, there is a suburban niche, a small piece of that 1950s American dream. Lines of houses with their perfect white picket fences and their perfect white wholesome families. Never ju- judge a book by its cover and never judge a neighborhood by its outward re- reputation. I'd be more worried if I did see that kind of place, honestly. I think I'd be like, uh-oh, something terrible is happening here, I'm sure. <laughs> Take, for instance, the community of Hollyview. The tiny piece of Americana could be anywhere in the country, but this particular subdivision is decidedly cut directly from the cloth of the pre-civil rights era, right down to the secrets lining the floors and windows in place of carpets and curtains. Ooh. Okay. That sort of thing is natural, the decay of values. That slice of the dream has been sitting on the windowsill for over 60 years. Some part of it was bound to grow mold. However, that corruption doesn't always stem from within the community. Sometimes there are far darker things lurking in the pools of luminescence that flood from the streetlights after the sun fades beyond the ever-present rows of trees that seem to insulate these kinds of communities from the rest of the world. Uh, my immediate thought is sundowner towns, but we'll see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Say that one more time. Sundowner towns. What are those? Basically, uh, if you were not a white person caught out after sundown, you were in trouble. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I'm saying oh. that right. Sundowner or like sundown, town sun, or sundown, sundowner or sundown town. Something like that. Place. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've actually not never heard that term before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it's a mixture of mold and flies. Once attracted to the stench of decay, they are monsters that lurk and wait for fresh carry on. Sometimes these evil creatures that stalk the streets after dark aren't human. Holly view, a hot place in the summer and a warm place in the winter. People have air conditioning for two reasons, to cool their homes and to give them an excuse excuse to stay indoors. The longtime residents don't much care for a nosy folk driving through to examine their well-groomed lawns, but they cannot stand the people who get out and ask questions. David. Where did you get those roses? Who do you use for your lawn? Have you seen this man? He went missing in this area a few days ago. People, they would say to each other in their weekly meetings of the elderly minds, people ask too many questions and poke their noses where they ought not to be smelling. These ladies, the matriarchs of the street, have twice as many skeletons in their collective closets as there were in any in the town cemetery. Despite that, they didn't fear for their own secrets. It was the secrets of what lurked in the dark that scared them. If people discovered the truth of Hollyview, their reputations would, would all be at risk. How would they be able to justify hiding secrets even greater than their misdeeds combined for so many years, they wondered. It all started in the 1960s. The houses were new, and so were their inhabitants. Families from all over town and country assembled to form the residency of Hollyview. The houses were in demand, so when a vacancy occurred, it was a sudden, it was sudden and unexpected. You know, um, with the, okay, I want to make a recommendation. Um, just because like reading these, this I keep, I can't help but keep thinking about it. I would recommend reading short stories by uh, Shirley Jackson, and Ooh, I don't, and yeah. I, I don't mean the lottery or anything like that. I mean, uh, read a lot of her short stories that come from the same book as the lottery, because a lot of them have to do with um, suburban 
suburban neighborhoods in the 1950s and it because this was actually written in the 1950s and this discomfort that occurs so like there's one short story where a woman sees uh, uh, a mother and her kid move in and there, she's just having a casual conversation with her and says, oh, we'll invite you to here. And she's like, oh, my husband doesn't like that. And, my hu- and then as they're talking, you could start to hint that this woman is probably being abused, but they don't say it outright. So the whole mm-hmm. time, the whole story is very uncomfortable. If you want to write like something with suburban discomfort, I would recommend reading her. Low-key suburban horror. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's never direct. It's never like, oh, it's in your face, but it's just the discomfort of feeling like you don't fit in or the sign reading for sale appeared overnight and no one could understand why anyone would want to leave the idyllic town. Then a few months later, another one appeared. Oh shit. Mm. This one was not placed there by the homeowner. However, it, they would discover was placed by the bank. The previous tenant, John Lawson had been declared legally dead by then. He had gone for a walk one afternoon and then simply never returned. His friends would wind up bearing an empty pine box. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Word began to spread. There was a murder, murderer lurking in the town, snatching up people and doing heaven knows what with them. It was then and there the remaining residents decided to stop these rumors. They knew that the more light people shone onto the missing people's lives, the more at risk their lives would be of coming into contact with daylight. The widower Annie McGee was the most concerned. She didn't want people looking too far toward disappearances. Her late husband disappeared a few months before the first sign was ever put up. If she was lucky, the police would connect this case with the rest of the missings. If she was unlucky, his case would be looked into a little bit closer, and she would ha- she would receive a gracious present from the city in the form of a pair of brand new bracelets. In truth, tired of his drunken abuse, she had taken him out into the woods that bordered the suburbs and pushed him down an embankment. She was certain they would attribute it to an alcoholic misadventure, but his body never was found. Only a few shreds of clothing from where he had fallen remained. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Fuck you, Craig. Fuck Fuck off, Craig. Craig, (laughs) you stupid motherfucker. Oh, Craig. Hi, so it's the next day. Uh... We had a technical snafu because Craig, being the whiny little bitch he is, decided to abruptly end in the middle of our recording to uh, go and get maintenance, I guess. (laughs) It actually said, it is now in undergoing maintenance. Recording will be stopped. And and luckily, Abysme caught it and let us know that that had happened, so... I uh we're 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 picking up again the next evening. So we this is a this is over a two day process. <laughs> she was a murderer, but she knew that at least she wasn't alone on the street. Sarah Ann, she never troubled herself with her last name, was highly suspected of killing a young man with her car one night on her way from an affair. However, her lover gave her an alibi. It spared her from certain jail, but it could not save her from divorce. <laughs> Then there was Jane Johnson, who lived at the far end of the road. She took it upon herself to poison animals in the surrounding neighborhoods because, as she viewed it, those nosy little creatures kept her up in all night. She also was trying to kill whatever it was she always saw across from her house, always standing on the sidewalk, just out of reach in the streetlight illumination. If it was anything, she always repeated, it was a dog, big, walking on all fours and sniffing around. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> Years had passed since the spree of disappearances and misdeeds, though they never truly stopped. Jane kept poisoning local animals. Bitch. Annie took a string of lovers who all met a similar fate. Sarah can... (laughs) No, I don't give a shit. She can fuck out as many of these solo shoes want. It's fine. Annie, Annie, you're cool. You can be a hoe as much as you want. Jane, go to hell. Poisoning local animals, you... No, no sympathy for Jane. None. Uh, Call animal control. Yeah. (laughs) Let them poison the animals. (laughs) Use your care and powers and (laughs) call them up and say, I need these animals out of my (laughs) thing. Whose manager can I speak to? Do it now before I poison. (laughs) (laughs) Shit. Uh, Sarah continued to commit herself to one and half a dozen of another, and people from uh, around town who came to that area at night were sometimes never heard from again. 
Nowadays, Hollyview is as much the same as it ever was. Perfect white picket fences and perfect white wholesome families. People don't visit too often for obvious reasons, though, even during the day. The paint on those white picket fences appears immaculate from a distance, but get close enough and you can see all the cracks in the facade. The flowers in the lawns are bright and colorful, but behind the rows of zinnia, z- zinnias? Zinnias. Zinnias, Gerber daisies, and Gerber daisies lurks weeds too tough to kill, only capable of being hidden. The shadows cast upon the houses by the street lights often linger a bit after sunrise, well after the lights have shut off. There are monsters living in Holly View, but some of them aren't even human. <laughs> Neat. That's kind of a. I. I, I, I would you call th- I call this like flash fiction? It doesn't even feel like fiction. It feels like a. I don't know. It's. It's, it's like interesting. Micro fi- not micro fiction. It's too long. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to describe it because it's there's not. Because uh, it. It's interesting, but I'm not sure where this would be written. It almost feels like a. It's not a character study because we're in a, in a way it's it a, is looking at. You know what? It is a character study, but the character Hollyview is the character. Oh, true. Oh, yeah. It's almost like a scene study or care setting study. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I I like where this is going. The idea that uh, it's both dealing with, you know, it's, it's dealing with a lot of different. Um, themes in terms of like the skeletons and people's closets and then you know monsters of different kinds i guess in in the facade of you know and we we all know when we see that facade we go oh i think we yeah. genres now we go oh yeah but uh, um i think i enjoyed uh the other story more so um but mainly because it felt more like a story uh this yeah. one this one still ha- has an interesting idea but it feels more like an idea. Right. That- it's not very fleshed out. It's kind of lacking. Well, it's not lacking structure. It's just lacking a narrative, I guess. I- Enough of a narrative. Yeah. I feel like this is uh, the setup for, uh, like, uh, this is what would happen. This is like a setup for a, um, actually, there is kind of a, X Files episodes sort of like this. Oh yeah, yeah it, it feels yeah. like a script treatment or something. Yeah, which isn't a bad thing. I write script treatments all the time. That's mm-hmm. what... no, 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 no. It's it's not a bad idea. It's just not really a um a, a story in the more traditional sense for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't. Hmm, I like it. I, I definitely think that the, the other story had the punch and it was more of, a, again, more of a narrative as, as we talked about, but this, I just think it's neat. Um, uh, Mark Simpson. I think it's neat. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, this would be a great idea for like a longer story. If uh, like someone moves in and into Hollyview and then starts to come upon. Yeah. Small little things. Cause we I, have characters um, that, could, uh, our protagonist could meet all these characters and slowly discover their secrets and who they're interacting with, maybe through talking with other people, who knows? But it's, um, yeah, it, 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 it could be a lot longer, but I don't know if Cleric's intention here was just to get this idea out really quickly, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. But I think, yeah, as it stands, it's just kind of really brief. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of like it. I, uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll say I kind of like it as it is, as just kind of a, a, a scene setter. Uh, a treatment and just kind of low-key exploring an idea because yeah um it's just trying to get a it's like a what if x kind of concept across you know Mm -hmm. what if x but y is also happening you know like i i I dig that and you know it could could it be expanded absolutely should it be expanded i don't know that's really up to cleric i'm not saying it should i'm saying it could but i as it is i think it's a perfectly serviceable little uh slice of suburban terror as the title so absolutely puts it. So, I mean, that's my takeaway. So, uh, I guess we already kind of low key gave our freshness ratings, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, the, it's, I, am I supposed to give my obscure freshness rating? Well, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you want to, um, um, I, let's 
let's see. So uh, for Cherry Le- Red Liberation, I would give this, uh, I would give that a red lipstick on the mirror. Uh, and I would give this one a, um, oh, uh, an upside down view of, uh, my God, I am blanking on the name of the book. Stepford Wives. There you uh. go. There you go. Uh, a new look. Uh, a new look into Stepford Wives. <laughs> I would give Cherry Red a be kind out of a rewind, <laughs> and I would give Suburban Terrors a uh, slightly chipping white picket fence. Mm. Um, I will give Cherry Red Liberation a. Um, an alarm set to 5.45 a.m. so you don't have to have your friend come over to get you to go to the garage sale. Uh, and I will give uh, Suburban Terrors a string of illicit lovers that all disappear one after the other. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I think that's a pretty accurate rating. I think that's fair. Uh. Yeah. Well, um, hey, I'm glad we were all able to get together to get to deal with Craig's bullshit. Yeah, this uh, uh, 10 minutes we had left, that was it. Yeah. That was <laughs> it. It, 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 it. It's insane because we would have continued, but the no joke, Craig said, um, we'll be down for maintenance for an hour. And it we was already like, late. We're like, no, we're not waiting around we, an hour. <laughs> we recorded like 40 minutes of dregs uh, before that because we <laughs> yeah. were so busy talking about stuff. And uh, I, I swear this always happens when fucking Bethesda gets involved. <laughs> Fuck you, Bethesda. Hmm. Uh, well, it's all good. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, if you want to support this show, best thing you can do, honestly, is just leave a like or a comment or a rating and review on whatever platform you happen to listen to this on, be this podcast or YouTube. It goes a long way. I like seeing people's feedback. I like knowing that people are engaging with the material we're putting out there because, you know, it sometimes, you know, it does feel like shouting into the void a little bit, but when the void shouts back, I do not feel terror. I feel like, uh, you know, I want to say hail Sithis. Hey, but that's the reference again. Hey. Um, uh, if you, you can also check out other shows on the Creative Horror Network at creativehorror.com. That includes uh, The Jameson Tapes and uh, Darkly Lit uh, and The Witching Hour, Midnight Marinara, and Trick or Track, among others. Uh, we all, some, of the, some of these shows are still updating. Uh- <laughs> I, uh, Jameson Tapes just came out, and uh, I got to be a guest on that one. Yeah. And it, and it was a really good episode, too. A really good episode, really good guest, really good, really good movie. So, really, yeah, really good brand of uh, Noriega leather. And you know, if you want to throw a little extra support behind us and all of these shows, you can join our Patreon, creativehorror.com slash or, or no, wait, hold on, scratch that, reverse it, patreon.com slash creative horror where uh, any dollar amount gets you access to the entire archive of our shows. That includes the drags that includes extra bonus bits from the past. And that includes some extra content from the Jameson tapes, as well as uh, the burgeoning series, which I desperately need another episode of Alan gets drunk and watches the thing, (laughs) uh, which I enjoy very much. Um, Those are my plugs as usual. Um, Also send over some stories. Uh, Yes, if you want to have your stories read on uh, our show, uh, gmail.com slash Midnight Marinara or Midnight Marinara at gmail.com. Wow, I'm really getting everything. You're really reversing it. Listen, I am. I'm tired. Okay, (laughs) these 10 minutes really wore me out. (laughs) Talk about fast performances here, everybody. I mean, this situation. But yeah, uh, Midnight Marinara at gmail.com is where you can send them. Uh, we are always looking for, you know, stuff to read and, and put out there and provide feedback on. Uh, and right now we're kind of doing in every other situation, ever since we discovered the doc, Dr. Satan stories, uh, we've been really enjoying doing those, but between those, we want to get back to our original mission, which is helping people improve their writing and offering honest and ridiculous feedback and critique. So yeah, feel free to send that to us if you'd like. And I promise we'll be considerate to you. i I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be we'll be considerate. We'll also sound like you like bumbling idiots as we do so. We usually are. As usual. Yeah, but that's how you know you get an honest review. You're not getting anybody trying to be flippant about anything. We're just like, no, we'll tell it like it is. But we'll be considerate. I mean, yeah. That's what you want, right? You want you want uh You want that uh, or you want what? the ha ha funnies. You get one. <laughs> you get one ha ha funny. And then the rest of it is just like hard line feedback. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> everybody gets one. <laughs> just one. <laughs> just one. And I'd like to thank uh, this episode's sponsor, Noriega Leather. <laughs> <laughs> Get at us, please. <laughs> Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at (laughs) creativehorror.com.